Hello, everyone. Joshua and Caleb, and we're here today with Bill Salas. Bill, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me back on your program, you guys. We are so excited, guys. The world is going through some tumultuous times, and for a lot of people, they've been caught off guard. Maybe you've read the Bible, but you don't understand the prophecy of what's happening. Uh, maybe you've never read it to begin with. And if you're just listening to the news or you're just watching protest rallies, you are going to be deceived on what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Bill has an amazing uh, insight into the scriptures on this topic. What he has to say is incredibly relevant for today. And That's we right. just want to pick your brain about what's going on so that we can uh, be most effective right now. That's right, Bill. You are an expert on Psalm 83. You actually a couple decades ago, really brought it to the forefront when people didn't consider it uh, impending or, or something that would actually occur. And now we're seeing nations come to alignment with this war with Israel and Gaza. What's your perspective on what's going on? Is this going to escalate into Psalm 83? Well, you know, it very well could. Um, we're seeing the stage has been set for quite some time with the enemies of Israel encircling them. Uh, gone to war with them in 1948, 1967, 1973. Uh, but they didn't really fulfill that particular prophecy written 3,000 years ago by Asaph, which talks about those countries that, that rallied together against Israel in 1948, Lebanon, where you have Hezbollah, uh, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, of course, the Palestinians, the Gaza, now where, of course, the Hamas are. They came together against the reborn nation of Israel in 1948. And it looked like Psalm 83 was going to find fulfillment then, but it really didn't because the whole psalm talks about ultimately those countries will come against Israel and be defeated soundly by the Israeli mm -hmm. Defense Forces so that they can never oppress the Jewish state again. And, of course, in 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria came right back at Israel. Uh, but what we see now, though, you guys, is... Uh, Probably, I mean, right now it seems like Pandora's box has been opened. I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle here with what's going on with Hamas. And and Felicia area where, where the Gaza is, ancient Felicia, and the Hamas are in there. They are part of the Psalm 83 prophecy. Matter of fact, there's several prophecies related to Felicia and or the Gaza that have not found fulfillment. But I think they sort of all are umbrellaed inside of the Psalm 83 prophecy. So what I'm watching for is if this escalates, could we see uh, several prophecies roll off their ancient parchments and pound down on the Mideast pavement, such as Psalm 83, such as Isaiah 17, which is the destruction of Damascus. Perhaps even mm -hmm. Jeremiah chapter 49 talks about a prophecy of dealing with Iran and ancient territory of Elam, E-L-A-M. And they all might come together soon and sequentially, uh, one right after the other. I kind of sequence them a certain way, but I'm not exactly sure which one's going to come next, but it looks like something could be coming real quick here. Wow. So right now we have uh, Gaza, looks like Hezbollah, Syria kind of taking uh, cheap shots. What are What's the entire coalition that we're looking for to escalate to become Psalm 83? Uh, what are all the, the modern day nations listed from the ancient names? Yeah, and they, these are countries that share common borders with Israel. They've been, they're Arab, they're, they're Muslim. They've been Israel's notorious enemies from time immemorial. They harbor an ancient hatred that dates back way to the time of Abraham, Sarah, uh, Isaac. Of course, you had Hagar was spawning this versus Sarah, the mothers. Uh, you had the the sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was at odds with Isaac. And this hatred was brewing and developing and incubating in the Middle East. And you had the the grandsons of Abraham, he had Jacob and Esau. Uh, Esau has descendants in the Palestinians today. He fathered the Edomites. Psalm 83 actually talks about the tents of Edom. Uh, that would be Palestinian refugees, seems to be. Tents of refer a, a, a refugee type of condition, biblically. Uh, and then, of course, it went on through to the cousins, Moab and Ammon versus the Hebrews. Moab would be Central Jordan, Ammon would be Northern Jordan, even down to the great grandkid of Esau, the Am Amaleks, down in the Sinai area. So these these are all patriarchs and matriarchs of these this hatred of the peoples and population groups that harbored the hatred, never went away, got enveloped in the, the Jew hating religion of Islam. And when in 1948, when it was back in the land, they had to face right up with it in that war. But it includes Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, 
Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Gaza area, and the Palestinians of the West Bank, per se. So it includes pretty much every all of Israel's surrounding Arab foes. So do you see these nations already coming into alignment thanks to this war with Hamas? Well, they, as I stated, they came into an alignment. These are the countries, and of course, these countries now have spawned terrorist populations. But these are the countries that voted against their being in Israel at the United Nations in 1947. And when there was an Israel, they told the Arabs that were living in there, that was formerly called Palestine, they said, get out, we need five days, there will be no Israel, we'll take them out with our armies. You go back into Israel, we just need five days, and you can take over the communities and the businesses. But that was a terrible miscalculation because they didn't realize that God had brought the Jews back into the land, fulfilling prophecies Amen. for big plans that he has for those chosen people. So they lost, and then alignment was established at that point in time. Now, meanwhile, after a couple of consecutive wars in 1967 with Egypt, Jordan, and, and Syria, and 1973 with Egypt and Syria, and of course Jordan got dragged into that, uh, Egypt and Jordan got tired of getting shellacked, decided it was lucrative and politically expedient for them to form peace treaties with Israel. But these peace treaties are fragile, and they're going to be voided out in some prophecies that are forthcoming. And yeah. it's interesting now, as we watch what's going on over there in the Middle East, and this, this show will probably air a little bit in the future from the day that we're recording this, but we're, we're hearing from Jordan, they're announcing things like, we do not want the Palestinian refugees to be you know, kicked out of the West Bank or the Gaza. We will not accept them. It will be considered a declaration of war. Egypt, President Sisi said the same thing. Egypt does not want the Palestinian refugees to be considered a declaration of war. So it's mm. the, the fragile treaties that Egypt and Jordan have, they're going to be gone. I'll give you one prophecy as an example. Jeremiah chapter yeah. 49, verses 2 says, I've heard there's an alarm of war, alarm of war in Rabah of the Ammonites that would be Amman, Jordan, the capital of Jordan. It says it shall be a desolate mound, and Israel will take possession of an inheritance. Zephaniah 2 is a different camera angle of that. There's Zephaniah 2, verse 8 and 9 says, I've heard the reproach of Ammon and Moab, that's Ammon, northern Jordan, Moab, central Jordan, against the borders of my people, Israel. Uh, and mm. because of that, their arrogant threats against the borders, it says, the residue of my people will plunder them, and the remnant of my people will possess them. So the Israeli defense forces will plunder them, and the Israelis will actually annex territory into Jordan, which is something that Israel wow. is has a history of doing. Joshua did it 3,300 3, years ago. David and Solomon did it 3,000 years ago. The Israeli defense forces did it in 1967. It increases the defensibility of Israel's borders. When you win a war, you can take territory. Also, they believe that's also part of the promised land given to Abraham back 4,000 years ago in Genesis 15, 18, from the river of Egypt, probably the Nile, to the river Euphrates, which courses all the way through Iraq and Syria. So it's we have to watch those fragile peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. They're not going to be lasting a whole lot longer. That's very interesting, Bill, because, you know, like you said, territories have to shift for these Bible prophecies to be fulfilled. That means a large swath of Jordan, which is the territory of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, must turn back to the Jewish people. Then the big question is, what happens to Gaza? I know that was originally the territory of Judah. Is there any kind of prophetic end to Gaza that you see in the near future? Well, there's actually a few Gaza prophecies. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of them to you because... These could actually be involved in the Psalm 83 prophecy because Felicia is part of the Psalm 83 confederacy. Uh, let's look at, we'll start with uh, Isaiah 11, verse 14. This might find a real-time application, kind of even in light of what we're seeing going on right now with the war with Israel and the Hamas. It says, but they, and I believe that could be referring to the Israeli Air Force, they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines. They shall fly down upon them. Interesting language written by uh, Isaiah about 700 B.C. It says they will move toward the west. That's of course where the Gaza would be. West, the southern western part of Israel. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. Perhaps that could be Syria and Iraq. Hmm. They shall lay their hand on Edom, the southern Jordan, and Moab, central Jordan. And the people of Ammon, northern Jordan, shall obey them. 
So it looks like we could have uh, the Air Force attacking the Gaza. That could be what's being said there. Uh -huh. And it goes on to say, it says in Zephaniah 2, verses 4 through 7. Let me pop this up a little larger on my screen here. It says, Gaza is going to be forsaken. And he's going to list a few other countries that were all part of the ancient Felicia territory. Ashkelon will be desolate. They shall drive them out of Ashdod at noonday. Ekron shall be uprooted. And what are the inhabitants of the seacoast? Probably alluding to the Mediterranean seacoast. The mm. nation of the Cherethites will also be involved in this prophecy, which will help will take you back to the Philistia area. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there will be no inhabitant. So ultimately, mm. they were going to be saying goodbye to the Hamas and the Gaza. It says the Mediterranean seacoast shall be pastures. And this goes back to your question. Mediterranean sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for the shepherds, folds for flocks. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. So Judah is going to get that area, that part of their tribal territory. They shall feed their flocks there in the houses of Ashkelon, and they shall lie down in the evening, for the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. So God's actually going to intervene. And it's kind of interesting when you look at Zechariah chapter 12, verses 4. Like the first thing I'm looking at, I got it kind of memorized here. That's great. You should have it all memorized. <laughs> the Word of God <laughs> in your head. I, I love it. Zechariah 12, 2, it says the time is going to come where Jerusalem will be made by God a cup of trembling or dizziness, mm. in some translations, to all the peoples round about, so many three countries, when they attempt to lay siege on Judah, Jerusalem. It goes on to say in Zechariah 12, verse 4, a couple of verses later, it says, In that day, I'm trying to lay siege on Jew and Jerusalem, I will strike the horses with confusion, the riders with madness, and the horses with blindness. And the Lord says, I will do that. Now, these guys are not going to be riding into Jerusalem on horseback. Yeah. So, <laughs> they're unfulfilled prophecy. So we're going, to, right. we're going to be coming at them with their artillery and things like that, and they're going to be hit with confusion. They're going to be malfunctioning. And that's going to, and the Lord is going to level the playing field. And this has biblical precedent because you go back in the time of the Egyptians were pursuing the Hebrews at the Red Sea, and they had their backs to the Red Sea. The, mm -hmm. cloud, the cloud came between the Egyptian army and the Hebrews. And it says that night the Lord went in and he, took and loosened off the wheels of the chariots, so it made it very difficult for them to proceed. So the Lord went in himself and intervened and took off the lug nuts of the Egyptian chariots. Wow. And, get that. and when that happened, the, many of the Egyptians said, let us flee from here for their, their God fights for them. But of course yeah. they did manage to get stuck in the Red Sea and the waters converged on them. But so God's going to intervene and when he strikes the uh, horses with confusion, is going to malfunction, probably uh, artillery malfunctions and things like that. And it says, I will strike the riders with madness, meaning there's going to be panic. They're going to be stricken with panic and hysteria. This is also going to happen in Ezekiel 38. That's uh, right. And that, that happens to be a great earthquake. And it says, every man's sword will be against his brother because they speak different languages. They're going to panic. They're going to start killing uh -huh. each other. So the, the, the Lord's going to strike these riders, these attackers with madness. And he goes on to say, and I will, I will strike the horses with blindness, meaning their guidance and radar systems will be disabled on some level. This is how I'm interpreting, interpreting this. I, and then when that happens, it says in verse 5 that the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the Israeli defense forces, the captains of Judah, will be emboldened. They'll be confident. Confident in the people. So when they see their God do this, and then here's the, the clincher. Zechariah 12, 6 says, in that day, again, when they're laying siege on Judah and Jerusalem, I would make the captains of the Israeli defense forces of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile, like a fiery torch amongst the sheaves, and they shall devour all the people on the left hand and on the right mm -hmm. hand in Psalm 10 feet. But mm -hmm. Jerusalem shall remain in its place again and be inhabited, O Jerusalem. So you know, the Israeli defense forces are going to be involved. The Lord is going to supernaturally intervene, and that's what we were seeing in Zephaniah 2, verses 6 and 7. The God, their God will intervene for them. So he's not only going to intervene in Ezekiel 38, but he's going to work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces in Psalm 83. That's right. 
do you see, I've always seen Psalm 83 having to be, uh, come in order chronologically before Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the war of Gog and Magog, because those nations immediately surrounding Israel have to be subdued uh, for those other nations to pass through them to reach Israel. What's your perspective on that timing? Well, that's a good observance. Um, and, and we also note that Ezekiel is very specific in the nine-member coalition he lists. Yes. Uh, by the region names, Magog, Tagarma, Gomer, etc. On a modern-day map, the general consensus is you're talking about an outer ring of countries, not an inner circle of countries. Psalm 83 is an inner circle of countries that share common borders with Israel. But Ezekiel 38 is an outer ring of nations, including Russia, Turkey, Iran, North African countries, Libya, Sudan, Ethiopia, perhaps Tunisia, maybe Morocco. Some people even throw Germany in there. Maybe some mm. of the stands, Kazakhstan, and stuff like that as well. But they're an outer ring of countries. And none of the inner circle countries of Psalm 83 are included. So your point is, well, why not? Why is Ezekiel so specific about who's involved omitting Israel's notorious enemy? Well, it's because I believe that Psalm 83 happens first. So mm. them and take them out. Because Ezekiel 38 has a couple of preconditions. One is Israel has to be a peaceful people, living tranquilly, both mm -hmm. without walls, bars, or gates, dwelling in the midst of the land, uh, dwelling safely in receipt of great plunder and booty and acquired livestock and goods because that's the motive of Russia's coming after, the bounty of Israel. And Israel's not dwelling securely without walls, borders, or gates. As a matter of fact, Israel's got a 403 mile wall, partition yeah. wall, some feet, 20 feet tall, filled with concrete, separating Palestinian terrorism out of Israel proper. They've also got walls on the northern border with Lebanon where Hezbollah are. That's why Hezbollah is trying to dig, dig tunnels. They've got mm -hmm. walls around the Gaza that were breached in the, the massacre with the Hamas. That's why they have an extensive tunnel network over there. They've got walls down by the Sinai in the Egypt area. They got walls along Jordan. I read Benjamin Netanyahu recently touted he's going to fortify that wall between yeah. Jordan and Israel to try to stop the flow of weapon smuggling coming through Jordan into the West Bank. So actually, Israel's the most fenced in and fortified country in the world. So mm. they're not dwelling with a wall as far as our gates. They've got security checkpoints throughout the place. They're not dwelling safely. The, the Hebrew words for dwelling safely, he uses them twice in Ezekiel 38, verse 8 and verse 11. Is Yeshav Vatak, and it's a textually it's a safety that that they, you obtain militarily, not politically brokered peace deal, but you obtain it because you defeated your enemies. Now you can dwell, dwell safely. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a verse that tells us when that's going to happen, and then I'll I'll shut up for a minute and let you guys ask some questions. No, no, <laughs> no this is great. Okay, here's when Yeshua's going to dwell securely: Ezekiel 28, verses 24 through 26. Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, and then I will be hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob, and they will dwell safely, you shall talk the same Hebrew words. They will dwell securely, you shall talk again, quotes it again. But when, when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them, then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. So they're not going to dwell safely until judgments are executed upon those around Israel, the Psalm 83 country, who despise them. And then they can dwell securely. They can tear down the walls. And then Ezekiel 38 can happen. So that's my long answer to your question, Kayla. Well, that's good. You know, I, I, what, I, what I love about this whole topic is that there's so many people today who think that the Old Testament is irrelevant to us right now. <laughs> and so right, right off the bat, let me just go ahead and say everything we've been discussing has been something that was prophetic that happened before the New Testament, showing that God is is using the whole package. Uh, so if somebody's just hearing about the Psalm 83 war now, what do you see as the conclusion to the Psalm 83 war? Well, the, the conclusion is going to be the judgment executed upon those around them who despise them. But I just read about in Ezekiel 28, verses 26. Yeah. The Israeli defense forces, like we said in Zechariah 12, 6, will devour those on the right hand and left hand. A couple of other prophecies they're involved in. Uh, Obadiah 1, verses 18 says, The house of Jacob will be a fire. The house of Joseph will be a flame. That's the Israeli defense forces. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. That would be mm -hmm. the Palestinians. 
Edomite representation from Esau down into the Palestinians. And all oh, Palestinians have Edomite descent, but you can certainly trace Edomite descent into the Palestinian refugees. So That's there's right. no survivor in the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah mm. 17, verses 1 says, If masks will suddenly cease from me in the city, it will be a ruin to see. Isaiah 17, 9 says that the desolation is caused by the children of Israel. There shall be desolation. So we see the Israeli Defense Forces are going to be called upon like a fiery torch against the sheaves in Zechariah 12, 6 to devour those on the left hand and the right hand. The judgment is executed upon those around them who despise them. That's going to be the conclusion. And ultimately, those countries will no longer be able to oppress the Jewish people. And that will be the end of Psalm 83. Wow. That's, that's going to change the entire playing field of the Middle East. And I'm sure it caused a lot of more hate and anti-Semitism than we've seen thus far and could possibly comprehend. But I mean, these events have to happen for, for certain occurrences to take place, such as the rebuilding of the Third Temple on the Temple Mount. There's no way they can do that right now. But for Jordan to be removed uh, and, and from that jurisdiction and territory, there has to be something drastic that occurs. You're right. And that once Jordan is removed, they will lose control mm -hmm. of the Temple Mount, and Israel will then want to move forward to build the Temple. They'll still get international clamoring against that. Yeah. Ultimately, they have to negotiate with the Gentiles, the outer court, we're told in Revelation chapter 11, John says, yeah. told, measure the measure the temple and those that worship therein, but don't measure the outer court. It's given to the Gentiles, and they're allowed to trot over Jerusalem for three and a half years. I believe that's going to be the heart of the world, the heart of the world religion, not the Arab, the Arabs we dealt with militarily. But mm. the point being is that they will still have, there'll still be international uh, opposition to mm -hmm. them trying to take the temple and build the temple. But they will build it. We know that according to prophecy. But yeah. they will have to negotiate with the Gentiles to do that. Well, Bill, I really appreciate your time you spent with us. Uh, this is all relevant to the day. This is all timely. We're seeing everything unfold before our very eyes. And uh, I think it gives me a sense of urgency that we need to pray. How should we pray uh, for the Jewish people? And how should we pray for America right now? Well, I know we, in our last show we did together, Caleb, um, you talked about your heart for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And you're, hope, you're hoping that that remnant survives, that one-third of Zechariah, chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. You're praying to enlarge the, the size of that remnant. Yes. Millions of millions of those Jewish people. So we, we need to pray for the Jewish people because inside, it, it's interesting, because Psalm 83 talks about this confederacy is going to come, confederacy is going to come together and form a Catholic council against the nation of Israel and against your hidden ones, it says. And I, and I think as you study that word there, it's D S A P H A N Safan. I think it's talking about the remnant, the, the Jewish remnant inside of the nation of Israel. Because the first usage of that word uh, was when Moses' mother took him and put him in the basket on the Nile River. He was part of the remnant of the nation of Israel. The second time that word was used was when uh, the, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of her name right now, Rahab. She, she oh, yeah. the two the children. Two spies. They were sort of remnants of Israel. So I think right. the point being is that uh, there's a remnant inside of Israel right now, and more and more of them are becoming believers. And those who become believers now will actually be raptured, but there'll actually be a remnant that goes through the tribulation, who will actually get saved, and they will be the they will be the nation of Israel. Although two thirds of them will be cut off, according to Zechariah 13:8. So we pray for that remnant inside of them. Help them to now know who they are become Messianic Jews before they have to become the faithful remnant and go through the tribulation. So I pray along those lines. Uh, mm -hmm. I pray also that that the church would get more interested in Bible prophecy, uh, use it as an evangelical tool because it's basically the pulpit is not teaching about this stuff. So the world is left with fake news in the sense of social media instead of the biblical narrative and the prophetic perspective. So we pray a lot that the pulpits would start to get more tuned in with Bible prophecy, those types of things. Thank you, sir. I yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's so important. You know, we often talk about uh, those percentages, the one-third, the two-third. 
And I think when people think of Bible prophecy, they um, will say, well, we can't change anything. But the math, what we talked about is you, you can stop the bottom line number. You can not you can change the bottom line number. So I can't change one third, two third. But the more I minister to, the more Jews we get saved, the more people that uh, come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua, that's less to put into that equation. And that's why that's I think right. it's so important. And that's what I love, you know, your, your ability to be able to so proficiently uh, explain prophecy, mm -hmm. having that in your hip pocket, like a boy scout to be able to use any time that the enemy comes with a lie, any time confusion comes your way, uh, guys at home watching this, this is the point of being proficient in the word of God. Mm -hmm. And this is the point of understanding why the father gave prophecy to begin with. It wasn't to just make us all feel inept at reading the Bible or to scare us so that we never read those scriptures. Uh, but it was so in times like this, we could stand for truth and we could stand against evil. And right now we see that the biggest evil in the world is that deception that continues to bring lies and continues to misdirect. That's right. Bill, how can people get a hold of you and your materials? Uh, do you have a website you'd like to promote? I do. I think and I will do that. But I want to follow up with what Josh just said. Okay. You know, Bible, Bible prophecy is a not only a witnessing tool, but it authenticates the sovereignty of God. We're told in Isaiah 49, 46, verses 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So God authenticates his sovereignty through Bible prophecy. If you want to know if there's a God, well, the Bible says about some future events that he's foretold, because that's how he's authenticating the one of the ways he's authenticating his sovereignty. My website is prophecydepot.com. Prophecy okay. Depot, like Home Depot.com. They go there, got an online bookstore with my books and products. I've got all my articles there. Got a YouTube channel you can visit with shows on it. And so that prophecydepot.com. Guys, I think you need to visit that website because, again, that, that's a great point you just brought up to say that it authenticates. Uh, God by his own word. Mm. We live in a day today where people do not take their word seriously. And so it's not actually even a forethought, I think, in most believers' mind that, well, we can actually verify that God's real by him fulfilling his promises. Because if I give my word to somebody today, uh, maybe I'll live by my word for a week or two weeks, but mm. then I find myself slipping up a month later. Well, here we are thousands of years later. Right. And because God gave his word one time to this group of people, because he gave his word to Abraham, he still blessed Ishmael in his line. All these different things. God cannot go back on his word and his covenant. And when we understand that as believers too, the assuredness it gives us about the promises that are made, we don't have to live in the same fear that the rest of the world is exposed to because we know the covenant we have is clearly dictated through his word. So that's, again, another reason why prophecy, another reason why going and, and learning from the materials that you have, I think is so vital today so that we don't just use the excuse, I don't understand, I don't have time, or CNN told me so. <laughs> right. And, you know, God is not someone with too much time on his hands. He's outside of the whole time and space continuum. And he's, it's not like he has a bad memory and he needs to take notes. And yeah. that's the right thing that can happen. He authenticates his sovereignty, but he gives us his information to inform us because he loves us. He wants to equip us for the days in which we live. Noah got the information. The flood was coming. He got busy with that information. Joseph got yeah. information seven years of Famine were headed in this way, but seven years of plenty, he got busy before that. We have this information given us from a loving God to prepare for what's coming because he loves us. And our volitional response, volitional response should be to love and worship this God who cares so much about us. That's powerful. And <laughs> that that to me at the very end of all of all of the prophecy is the most important part of it. It exists to prove his love. Wow. His love is always at the center, but everything he's done. And he has gotten this this horrible reputation created by man throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. And yet man has misunderstood that the greatest love that could ever be experienced was given to us and is continually given to us on a daily basis. And I, I, I think that's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us again, Bill. You have been so insightful and in your wisdom and just your knowledge of the scripture. It is, it's just an honor to get to speak to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it all the time.